thankful all of thankful to all of y'all that stayed ate lunch with us and uh, please don't fall asleep but uh, we'll have a, a good session uh, now to begin here in just a few minutes and uh, we are very thankful for uh, Mr. Brown and his wife for coming and joining us and for the great work that that they do in the kingdom of the Lord um, We'll go ahead and make our announcements now just to save time at the end. At, at the end of his presentation this morning, um, he'll have some uh, question and answer, have a question and answer session. So um, uh, we will enjoy that and look forward to learning more uh, in the scriptures. Uh, so those additions to our announcements this morning were that Matt Conway had gallbladder surgery this past Friday and uh, he's home recovering. Eli McDuffie um, is, uh, will have eye surgery uh, this week, so let's uh, remember him and, and that family. And also, uh, Shelly Ryle Harson uh, has discovered that she has breast cancer, and so we need to check on uh, Shelly and Mark. And uh, that's all that I have at, at this time. First song this afternoon will be number 501, 501. Oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and grateful we sing His wonderful together. Dear Lord and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful that you are Father. We're thankful for the love, grace, and mercy that you've extended to us so freely, dear Lord. We are thankful, dear Lord, that you provide our every need, and we pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to guide us, to walk with us each day, to guard our 
thoughts and the intents of our heart. Help us to, to be the very best we can be each day. Dear Lord, we are so mindful and thankful for Jesus Christ. We're thankful that you were willing to give your only begotten Son. We're thankful for his willingness to be that perfect sacrifice and to be the reconciliation between you and us, dear Lord. Help us to uh, concentrate on the sacrifice that he made daily. Help us to be ever thankful for that, dear Lord, and, and help us to, uh, to strive to be more like Jesus each day. We realize that he went about doing good. We realize that he was caring and compassionate, and he always looked for opportunities to help those around him. We pray that that mind would be in us also. Dear Lord, we are thankful for Brother Brown. We're thankful for the time that he is spending with us. We're thankful for the words that he has already spoken. We're thankful for the knowledge that he has of your truth, dear Lord, and how he can present that to others and how can he can affect the lives of others through his example and his teachings, dear Lord. We look forward to the words that he has to bring before us this hour. We pray that you would be with him and help him to have a ready remembrance of the things he's prepared, dear Lord, and help us to be open and receptive to the things he has to say. Help us to gr gain a, a greater understanding of how the Holy Spirit works in us and, and helps us each day, dear Lord. Help us to be students of your word. Help us to apply those things that we learn from your word, dear Lord, that we might be better servants of thine each day. Dear Lord, we're mindful of many who are sick and afflicted, and we realize that there are so many, there are many that have been listed on our prayer list. We're mindful of each of those. We pray your loving and, and tender hand be upon those, that you would heal them, that you would comfort them as only you can, dear Lord. We pray for the caregivers, the doctors and nurses who are attending to each of those. We pray that their efforts uh, would be blessed and be beneficial to those, dear Lord. We pray that each one of those will be back with us just as soon as possible. Dear Lord, we're mindful of those who are serving this country in the military, and we realize the great sacrifice they make. We pray that you would bless those individuals. We pray that you would bless their families. We pray that those who are separated from their families would be brought back home just as quickly as possible, dear Lord. We pray that uh, we might experience peace in this world, dear Lord, that uh, cooler and calmer heads would prevail and be able to make decisions that uh, are beneficial to mankind, dear Lord, that we might live in peace and harmony. We pray, dear Lord, that the world would, would come to know you on a greater level, dear Lord. We know that Peace can only be found in you, dear Lord. Help us as your children to be the proper influences each day and to spread the word, the good news that is Jesus Christ throughout our neighborhood and our communities in this state and in the nation and abroad. And we appreciate those who are serving as missionaries and, and the work that they have ongoing. We pray that you would continue to bless those efforts that we support and so many other efforts, dear Lord. We pray that you would bless each of these, dear Lord, that the world might come to a, a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with us through the further exercises of this service. We pray that each and everything said and done here will be in accordance with your will. Dear Lord, we pray that you will be glorified and honored through this service, dear Lord, and help us to look for opportunities to do good each and every day. Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark the invitation, the song will be number 207, 207. The song before the lesson will be number 833, 833. If you would, please stand. <coughs> There's a message you and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out, bring it out. It will give them courage to it will help them to be true. Bring it out, bring it out, bring out the word for land and sea, still far from Jesus.
scripture, or scripture reading this uh, afternoon will be 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, Again, we are grateful to have this opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Certainly, we are grateful for the great meal that was served downstairs. Uh, if you're anything like me, you want me to hurry up, stand up, talk, and sit down because that food was so good and is so much resting on us. And I don't plan to disappoint you on that. I don't plan to take up too much time, but I do want to share something that I hope will encourage us and inspire us as we continue on in our life with the Lord. Uh, I ate so much that I actually told Brother Chris the wrong text. That's actually 1 John chapter 3, uh, 1 through 3. Uh, blame it my, uh, on my belly and not my head. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll just take a quick look at that text of Scripture, and then we will dig into a lesson this afternoon. Uh, 1 John chapter number 3, beginning at verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Well, it's happening all over the place. I'm sure you've heard it in the news. I'm sure you've seen it on television commercials. We are all potential targets, and some of us have already been victims. What is it that I'm referring to? I'm referring to identity theft. When we think about identity theft, we learned that 15 million customers experienced it in 2017. And it's still happening every day that we wake up to. Well, I wanted to start with that because when we look at the first letter of John, John is dealing with members of Christ who are having an identity crisis. They are the victims of those who were troubling them and telling them that they weren't really followers of Christ. You see, there were some people that had been a part of the church, but they had become so much more learned, so to speak. And as a result of that, they thought that you needed Jesus, but there was a little bit more you needed. In fact, they had come up with some pre-Gnostic ideas of some special ways to break through the uh, uh, images between heaven and earth that would allow them to get closer to God. And they felt that only they had these special keys of knowledge that would allow a man or a woman to really be tied with the divine creator. These same individuals had come back to the church that John is writing to, and they had convinced these individuals that they no longer could be satisfied or even claim to be children of God. And so the Christians to whom this letter was written were experiencing identity crisis. I think you and I have to be very mindful about identity crisis, not just on our Macs and our PCs, our phones and our iPads, but we need to be aware of identity crisis when it comes to who we are in this world. When you look at this text of scripture, the first thing that ought to come to mind is you and I really need to know who we are. 
We need to know who we are. We're living in a time of universal identity crisis, seemingly across the globe, but especially within this country, our experience is seeing confusion, division, chaos in practically every area of life. When we think about life in some households, we find children are acting like parents or parents are acting like children. In the area of gender, some don't know, simply don't know if they're male or female. When we think about the area of churches in general, we're finding that rather than claiming the name of Christ, we're more affiliated with a political uh, uh, a title or party. We are finding ourselves dealing with the devil who is waging all-out war against us, working on all fronts to make us forget who we are. But John comes right to the rescue by telling us, Beloved, you are the children of God. He doesn't state that with a sense of, uh, I'm not sure what I'm saying. He states that with a very powerful, bold, yet humble proclamation. We are the children of God. You and I can recognize, just like John's audience could recognize then, that right now as I stand here and as you sit here, we are God's children. John helps us to understand that in a chaotic world, we need to remember our identity. We're living in a time of national tension, national truth crisis social upheaval, and we've got to remember that we are children of God. Can I remind you that every obedient response to the gospel results in somebody becoming a child of God? And as a child of God, we've got to remember that we can enjoy the privilege of an intimate relationship with the Godhead. You know, Christianity, following Christ, is not about coming to a church service. I love church assemblies, I assume you do as well, and we get a lot of strength and we derive a lot of motivation from church worship services and Bible classes, but it's deeper than that. Following Christ is deeper than just reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible. I assume you do as well. And we gain so much information and so much strength and motivation and encouragement from the book of God. Dare I say even inspiration from the book of God, but it's deeper than that. Following Christ is about a relationship where we get in union with the Godhead, where we get to walk with Jesus. We get to walk with the Father. We get to walk with the Holy Spirit. It's about relationship. And perhaps you hadn't thought about this, but you know heaven, the real beauty of heaven, is relationships restored to what they always were intended to be. We get to hang out with God, so to speak, in the way in which we were originally intended to be. We have the privilege of that type of fellowship. And isn't it interesting that John starts off with that in the first chapter of this letter? He talks about our fellowship is truly with the Lord, and you and I can make that same claim. And so in this time of identity crisis, when our world is really segmented, society is divided, and there opposing groups on every side, let's never forget that we are nothing more and nothing less, and who wouldn't want to be anything more than a child of God? I challenge you this afternoon, don't go around having people identify you as an independent, a Republican, or a Democrat. You're a Christian. You're a child of God. I challenge you from Genesis, or rather Galatians 3, verse 26 through 28, there's neither bond nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Brown, who do you support? Jesus. Where do you stand? Jesus. What's your outlook on life? Jesus. What's your worldview? Jesus. Because I am a child of God. And that weighs more than anything I could ever be described as. I am a child of God. We are children of God. Neither race, gender, social status, or even educational level, Bible or otherwise, should be how we're identified. But rather, we ought to be determined 
to think about our relationship with the Lord and therefore we are defined as children of God who live in this world seeking truth and justice for everybody. Don't have an identity crisis and think that you are anybody else but a child of God. Not only that, we need to remember as we examine this text, we need to remember why we are who we are. You and I aren't children of God because we've been so good. We're not children of God because we've thought so well and we, we behaved so well and, and we've been good to our neighbors and we paid our taxes and we voted every election or whatever the case may be. We are who we are based on the grace of God. There's not a human being, past, present, or future, who has ever earned a relationship with God. And I will give you one slight exception, if you can call it an exception, and that's Jesus Christ, who became man and lived a perfect life as a human being. If there's anyone in the world, ever been in this world, who's ever earned righteousness, it's Jesus. He came in the form of man. He lived as a human. Somebody says, well, he, he could turn stone into bread. He could uh, give sight to the blind. Uh, he, 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 could, he could give, uh, take water and turn it into wine and all of these things. Yes, because he never stopped being God. But he did not use his God attributes, if you will, his God quality, if you will, in order to live a life of obedience. He lived a life of obedience based on the same resource as we have. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus lived as a human and he obeyed God's law perfectly. Well, what about the scribes and the Pharisees who said that his disciples didn't observe the law, didn't wash their hands properly? What about uh, the, the idea of healing on the Sabbath? Didn't he break God's law? No, he broke man's, man's interpretation of God's law. But when it came to the pure law of God, he lived perfectly, a perfect life. And why did he do that? Because he came to earn righteousness, not for himself, but for us. And he went to the cross, and he died on the cross, and he was raised, and he gives us the righteousness that he earned based on grace. That's what grace is all about. That's what grace is all about. Grace is not about me or you earning anything. As you know, it is unmerited favor. Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves, and he is taking us where we can never go by ourselves, and he is taking us to a full experience that we can never gain on our own. You and I are who we are because of what Christ has done for us. If there's any people in this world who ought to always have a, how, a bowed head and a humble heart is children of God. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget why you are who you are. Because God made it all possible through Jesus Christ. And then, as we look at this text another time, I'd like you to see what John says and how he says it. He first of all talks about God and the love that God has put toward us. And then he says that we should be called children of God. People like us are called children of God. But not only that, the world, look at the verse, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And then the kicker comes in, behold, we now are children of God. Right now, we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Watch this now. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Not only must we remember who we are, not only must we remember why we are who we are, but lastly, we may stay focused on who we will be. Maybe you've heard this terminology before, but the New Testament is full of it. Actually, the entire Bible is full of it. It's the, 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 the tension between the now and the not yet. Right now, we are children of God. And not yet are we who we will be. That's the tension between the now and the not yet. <laughs> the book of Revelation is full of it. The, the great victory has been won. The victory has not yet been won. The tension between the now and the not yet. 
the already and the not yet. We are right now the children of God, and the world hasn't recognized it, but, 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 but there's going to be a time when we will be revealed for who we really are. And John goes on to say, when we see him, we will be like him. Oh, I can confess boldly before you right now, I'm not always like Jesus in my behavior. And I'm surely not always like him in my thoughts. There are some days where I'm in left field and sometimes I haven't even come into the ballpark in terms of my mindset. And I think that I'm probably not alone in that. And yet I'm still called a child of God. But the beautiful thing is, although I'm living in the already, I'm a child of God, the not yet is coming. And when I get there, when I see Jesus and when you see Jesus, we'll recognize him because we will be like him. Isn't that the same thing Paul wrote in Romans chapter number eight? He says the goal of Christian life is to be like Jesus. The goal of Christian life is really to be like Jesus. In my ministry, I have a goal of trying to fill the building but not just for head count. I want people who are gonna start becoming more and more like Jesus. My goal for retirement, I wanna have enough money there whereby I will not outlive the money. But my real goal is to be like Jesus. Your goal, my goal has got to be like Jesus. So that brings in the last part of what John says. If you notice verse number three, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. When the Lord comes again, and who knows when that will be, it may be sooner than later. I'm quite convinced it'll be sooner than later. We want to be like him. We have that goal at heart, but God has that goal at heart for us. And because of that, everyone who really believes that will be about the hope of that is purifying and must purify himself or herself just as the Lord is pure. I wanted to end up on this lesson because I wanted to dovetail all three of the lessons. I wanted to get us to the point where we recognize, first of all, we have the Holy Spirit as our witness. Secondly, uh, uh, Christ in us is the hope of glory, and that is speaking about the Holy Spirit's work in us. And then lastly, uh, this idea of identity crisis, when we become who we are through Christ, and we have, and we're becoming more like Christ, the Holy Spirit is engaged once again as we work to purify ourselves. Why are we doing it? Why are we working with him? Because we want to be pure like Christ. We want to look like him. We want to think like him. We want to act like him. Because as quiet as it's often kept in America's pulpits, no one's going to heaven that's not a little Jesus. Everybody's got to be him in terms of character, in terms of life. And thank God we are not left to ourselves. The Spirit of God is there to help us to become more and more like Jesus. There was a song I used to hear when I was a young man in the church in Trenton, New Jersey. And for those of you who didn't know, I am, I am a native of Trenton. I'm not a native of Huntsville, Alabama. And if you were around me more, you would hear the Trentonian slip out by way of my accent. But I work hard not to let it come out right now. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I, I try to do that. Uh, but we used to sing a song entitled, More About Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, bringing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. Beautiful song. But what's, what's even more beautiful is when the song becomes a reality. Not in terms of head knowledge, but in life knowledge. John said, the world doesn't know who we are right now, but one day they will. Can you picture your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend, your enemy, one day coming to recognize you for who you really are all the time and not just on a good Sunday afternoon? More, more about Jesus is great. More like Jesus is even greater. And so let me leave you with this this afternoon. As you live your life daily, First of all, remember who you are. You're a child of God. Above everything else you are, you're a child of God. I moved down to Alabama uh, in 1992. 
I started working, and then the first thing I was asked, well, are, are, are you War Eagle or are you Roll Tide? I didn't know what they were talking about. I came to find out, and somebody accosted me and said, well, you have to pick a side. I said, I'm Penn State. Because that's where I was. There are people who are known by their sports team. Be known for being a child of God. People ask all the time, I get the literature in the mail as well as you do. Oh, which way are you voting this year? Democrat, Republican, Republican, Independent? I'm voting Jesus. Because that's what's more important. I don't want to be known by any other moniker. I want to be known as a child of God. Depending on what part of town we live in, people identify as. Be known as a child of God. Remember who you are. And then secondly, remember why you are who you are. Never get to the point of the peacock who shines those bright feathers. Remember, we are only who we are. You're an I, you and I are only as good as we are right now, if you want to use that terminology, because of what good is being done in us. And then lastly, always strive to be who we are called to be. And that's where the Spirit comes in again. Remember, not your own power, not your own might, not your own muscle. It's a spiritual dynamic that takes us from where we are to where we need to be. Amen? Amen. If you have a need this afternoon, we dare not close out our meeting without asking you to respond to Christ. Someone may have a need for the waters of baptism. Why not this afternoon? Someone may have a need for prayer. Why not this afternoon? Let the Lord meet your need right where you are in which way you need. As we sing this song of encouragement, would you please stand with me? Lord, the gentle voice of Jesus calleth tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth turn and listen, stay and hear. question and answer session. Um, at the end of that, uh, as we sing a, a closing song after that session, if you weren't able to attend this morning and, and uh, need to um, partake of the communion, it's uh, been left available in the library or down the hall and you can exit at that time. Uh, I do want to also mention that uh, one of our dear sisters who one time in the past moved away from us and then came back home, uh, is now moving away again, not quite as far this time, but to Corinth, uh, Vicki Downs. And so this uh, may be her last Sunday to attend regularly with us, but it's not that far a drive from Corinth. So anyway, y'all be sure and uh, encourage Vicki and tell her how much you, you love her. All right, Michael.
Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this jacket off so I can enjoy this. This is actually the part I look most forward to and uh, definitely wanted to have a shorter lesson so I can get to this part and get this part in. But I received a series, a, a handful of questions, not a series, a handful of questions before I came and I was excited about having the opportunity to answer these questions and possibly to entertain some new ones. So uh, I'll just share them with you if you don't know what they are and I'll respond to them. And I'm looking because one set of questions came to me by way of a picture and uh, we've been having some fun laughing about that but uh, I'll try to find that as well. All right. Uh, as you know, uh, the book uh, Life in the Holy Spirit, Life with the Holy Spirit, uh, that is a book that came out 2000. 12-ish, I guess. Somewhere in there, I've forgotten. Um, covered a lot of territory since then. But um, these questions were based on your study of that book, and I want to thank you again for using it. But one of the questions is, what is the mainstream Church of Christ stand, stand is in quotes, or belief on how the Holy Spirit operates today? That's a good question. That's a loaded question. Um, let's be historians for just a little bit. So, I'm sure you're aware of the Restoration Movement. Um, if not, I would encourage you to become more aware of it. Uh, who we are today does not come uh, directly out of Acts chapter 2. Don't misunderstand that statement. What I'm saying is uh, we have history in our roots that take us through the Restoration Movement. Now, that doesn't need to scare you at all. That's just a recognition of facts. Um, I, I don't believe in apostolic succession and I don't believe in church succession in the sense of having no history. So there are two basic streams that came forward through the restoration movement. These are names you're familiar with, Stone and Campbell. These are two basic streams. Uh, Brother uh, Alexander Campbell was more of a uh, a, a rationalist uh, and uh, he had come out of the uh, seceder Presbyterian movement and Barton Stone was different more focused on experience uh, those two streams came together in the 1800s and uh, one of the things that was tension was the Holy Spirit one of the subjects that was tension uh, Stone was more engaged in a experiential thing relative to the Holy Spirit. His Cane Ridge Revival experience uh, was amazing to him, where there were, if my memory serves me correctly, seven different preachers at the same time in a revival. And um, word is, historians capture that, the spirit fell on people and uh, some people fell out in ex ecstasy, uh, others caught jerks and shaking and some howled and all of that stuff that took place. Well, Barton Stone considered that a work of God. Uh, let me interject right here. I, I'm not with that, but uh, that's what he considered it to be. Uh, Alexander Campbell's mindset was that, no, this is not really the way things work. This is, this is human emotion being touched by the excitement of the moment. Uh, well, I have to mention that because uh, our brotherhood from that time has always had this tension about the Holy Spirit. David Lipscomb, um, one of the characters in the Tennessee area, and I just mentioned him because of his name being prominent, but then there were several others, always had the thought that the Spirit uh, however you think about it, was not doing miraculous stuff today. All right? They weren't talking about the idea of miracles being performed. That wasn't a denial of the Holy Spirit, but it was a thought that we have the Word of God and God is not doing the, mir the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit today. Uh, that thought held sway for a good while until we hit about 1966 and there was a lectureship in Abilene Christian University 
And four prominent preachers at the time began to start thinking a little bit differently about the Holy Spirit. Heretofore, the thought had been that the Spirit uh, is basically the Word, the, the written Word. And um, the Spirit is external to you. He's all in the book, but he's, he's, he's external to you. Uh, but then, as I said, 1966, I think I have that date right, at that lectureship, more, more thought was coming forward. No, there's an indwelling that actually takes place. So, all that around the barn to get to the question, where's the mainstream view of the Holy Spirit among uh, Christians today? Uh, well, I still would think the mainstream is on the line of word only, it's called. Spirit working word only. But that's changing rapidly. And what's forced change is the introduction of the charismatic movement in the 80s into this country. And there's been this movement of people who are really interested in uh, the, the spirit doing more. Uh, in my own opinion, I believe that a lot of that, again, has to do with wanting to have the word be relevant. There are people who don't like the idea of, uh, okay, this is an ancient book and it's got great stuff, but what about today? And so the charismatic movement came on with the idea of, in my own words, breathing God into the current time. And you get extremes of that. Uh, Joyce Meyer, I read a book where she told about the Holy Spirit helping her fix herself up. Um, Creflo Dollar, I'm mentioning people who've gone on the extreme. You've heard of these names before. But then there are those who aren't extreme, and yet they still think, well, the Spirit has to give me a relevant word. And you get things like, well, the Spirit told me to tell this young man, well, how old are you? Fifteen. Fifteen. Uh, the Spirit's telling me for you to go to Ole Miss. <laughs> you know, so you, 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 you get that stuff, right? Uh, and for the most part, Churches of Christ have never wanted to be associated with... Uh, what is known first as a holiness Pentecostal uh, focus of continued spiritual act experience or now charismatic. But there is a strand within Churches of Christ that's moving in that direction. So where do we stand today as a, as a brotherhood? Uh, largely still word only, spirit, spirit word only, but there's a growing move against that. And got to be careful about it. Got to be careful about that. I think there's a danger either way to go to the extreme. Um, but I think um, for the most part, and I hate the terms conservative and liberal because they, they, they don't really do justice. But for the most part, that conservative viewpoint that Campbell produced is most prominent. All right? And I'll just keep with these questions unless I see your hand. So the next question I received was, has this belief changed over the years? I think I've addressed that. Yes, it has, and it is. A lot of our younger people in, in our schools, in many of our schools, are being influenced more and more by the popularity of, uh, of the charismatic approach to the scripture. And, and let me say this, let me say this. Uh, you have to understand, when we talk about holiness and Pentecostal from the inception of the 1800s, even the 1700s, uh, that idea largely comes out of Wesley. Wesley came here to try to do some missionary stuff. It didn't turn, turn, didn't, didn't, did not turn out so well. He just felt like there was something missing, and I'm flying at 50,000 feet here. And so he, he sought a, a, a more emotional euphoric connection with the Lord and lo and behold that's kind of where that came from uh, holiness movement and the Pentecostal movement come out of that idea the thought at the core of those movements was well if we see it in the book of Acts this way how come not today that's a fair question and where do we back to the Bible what we have to run into, though, is, well, there are some things that are kind of difficult to wrestle with that you see in the early centuries, uh, early century of the church, first century of the church, that you don't see today. So there's, there's, there's kind of where that debate comes out. And a lot of the thought of Churches of Christ eschewing uh, the miraculous element of the Holy Spirit, even to the point of not wanting to accept 
the Holy Spirit indwelling, a lot of that comes out of a reaction, well, we don't want to be that, so we're here. And sometimes that can be a dangerous approach as well, okay? So again, is it changing? Yes, it's changing. Uh, do we have to be careful? I, I think we always have to be careful. I think the church is always one generation away from apostasy. Uh, the third question I received, what inspired you to write your book on the Holy Spirit? Another good question. My focus was on victorious living. That's the germ thought that I had. How do we, in the 21st century, how do we live a life that's God-honoring, victorious over Satan? How do we do that, and what does God say about that? That was where I began my thinking. I didn't begin with the two schools of thought that have always existed among us. And oh, by the way, those two schools of thought are not just among churches of Christ. This goes back to the Montanists of the second century. It's always been a battle. And we've had, uh, what, the Council of, uh, Chals Council of uh, Constantinople uh, arguing over, well, how does the Holy Spirit, is, first of all, who is he? Is, is it it or he? So though, that, this is a long debate, all right? And we're just pulled into it as well. But I began not wanting to look at the debates. I began wanting to look at how do, how do we see the Bible talk about the Holy Spirit today and how does it make the book of God, how does it make Christianity relevant today? How do we deal with it? Uh, young people who are wrestling with different issues. Our children are growing up in a much, a vastly different world than, than most of us did. And they're facing things that we never thought about. So I'm sure the Word of God speaks of that too. So, so how does the Spirit deal with all that? That's where the book came about. And so most of the book deals with the different ways in which the Spirit helps us give a witness for Christ in this world and grow to be more like Christ in this world. But I couldn't ignore some of the misunderstandings understandings about the Holy Spirit, so I included some of that as well. But that's where the inspiration came from. Uh, I had another question. In your teaching, preaching book, have you ever gotten challenged about your beliefs? Well, what do you think the answer is to that? <laughs> I don't believe there is any sincere Bible teacher that won't encounter challenge. I think that's impossible because of who we are in our background in the sense of what we've been exposed to. And the more you become exposed to in your learning, the greater amount of questions you're going to have. That's just the way life is. You grow up in a bubble and then you go to the university, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> you're going to get challenged about things. Even if you go to a Bible college, you're going to get challenged about various things. So as you get challenged and as you formulate your thinking, uh, not everybody's going to agree. So uh, I've had non-direct challenges to the stance that I, that I take. And I have to say, and I'm glad to say, nothing has been ugly. It's just, hmm, hadn't thought about that. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you consider about this? I, I don't think myself to be the, the last word spoken about the Holy Spirit, by no means. Uh, I'm on this continuous quest to learn more about God's will regarding this subject and all subjects, and I believe you are as well. And I think as we do that, we have to be willing to accept questions because they only help improve us as we, we dig deeper. How many of you have teenagers home? Any hands of people with teenagers? Just a few? Do they challenge you? <laughs> kind of happens, right? Uh, you know, why are you doing it that way? That's the way I grew up. Oh, the world's different now. Oh, be quiet. You know, it just goes back and forth. So. Uh, I received the question, if challenged, what was, the, what was the argument and how have you dealt with them? Well, one thing I don't do is debate. I don't debate. I don't debate my brother and sister in Christ. I, it's fruitless to me to do that. But I will have a cup of coffee and an and a, and a open Bible with that person any day of the week, any night of the week, because I may learn something 
that I didn't think about and vice versa. Because the whole idea to me is that we grow stronger in our understanding of the book of God. We have the same goal in mind. Uh, I read this somewhere. When I love you more than I love victory over you, we can resolve our conflict. And when it comes to this subject matter, I'm not interested in conflict. I'm interested in reconciliation with the individual and a better understanding of the word. So it's been no problems with that. Um, oh, here's another question I received. If you could challenge us regarding one thing regarding the teaching of the Holy Spirit, what would that be? Well, the only unfortunate thing about that question is it just said one thing. <laughs> I really can't say just one thing. If I had any encouragement and challenge to you today, it would be recognize he is real. He's real. He was wanting to do something in you. And you have the choice to let him have his way. He is as real as Jesus. He is as real as the Father. We talk about Jesus all the time, and we should. But remember, Jesus talked about the Spirit in a great detailed way. He's the one who told his disciples, I'm going away, I'm coming back. I'd rather, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming back right now, but I'm going to ask the Father to send you another comforter. That's the Greek term that means another who is not the same, but just like me. All right? Another of the same kind. You have him. And I have him, and he's real. So that's the first thing I would say. If I were to say 1A, it would be, let him do something radical in your life. What do I mean by radical? Think about what you challenge with by way of behavior, thought, attitude, whatever it is. Think about what that is. Focus on that. Spend time in the Word on the teaching on that. And in your prayer, concentrate earnestly on asking God to work in your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to work on your heart on that. And I give you one promise that I have no deal, no, no worries about granting, no, no worries about stating. The more you do that, I guarantee you that God will put something in your path that week that will force you to come to grips with what you asked him for. He'll do it. He'll make you force, he'll, he'll force you to deal with it because you asked him. That's where you'll start recognizing the Holy Spirit working with you. He won't whisper to you. There's a difference between the providence of God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I listened to a guy the other day, I can't think of his name, um, he's got a, he had a mega church, he dropped out of it, uh, and I just can't call his name right now, but he was talk, giving a talk on the Holy Spirit, and he said, it's like this, I'm I was driving down the street, and, and, and then all of a sudden I heard a voice, and it said, turn right, and I turned right, and then when I got back on the road, I realized there was a massive accident right there that I would have run into. Uh-uh. That's providence. There's a difference between providence in the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The prompting of the Holy Spirit has to do tremendously with our behavior. So you just came out of this knock-down drag-out with the person you could care less about anyway, or the same knock-down drag-out with somebody you really love. And all of a sudden, you're, being, you're remembering teachings of the Word about how you should have acted. Oh, that's not luck. That's the Spirit reminding you of what you need to do to get things straight. When the Bible talks about quench not the Spirit, it's that kind of stuff. I think we know enough to get into heaven. It's not a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of doing. And the Spirit is there to urge us to follow, always in consistency, always in agreement with the Word of God. All right? Uh, and then the two questions that were sent to me by picture. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I know who asked the questions, but I'm trying to keep his name out of this. 
Let me see if I can find these pictures, this picture. Hmm. All right, let's try it this way. Now, if I can't find these questions, I'm going to have to uh, beg forgiveness and ask the person to repeat those questions. Ah, here we go, here we go. This concerns prophecy in tongues. 1 Corinthians 13, 14. And the question is, when the New Testament is complete and the apostles are, I'm assuming, gone, I'm taking this question to mean, are, are these spiritual gifts, prophecy, and tongues still available? I'm taking the question to be that. Uh, in a word, I, I don't believe so. Uh, I think in 1 Corinthians 13, but I also include chapter 12. I, I, I go back to chapter 12, 13, 14 together. Uh, the discussion underhand at that point, the teaching underhand at that point, has to do with the communication of God's truth. Tongues were about giving God's message. You see Acts chapter 2. How do we all hear this glorious message of God in our own tongue, our own language? About communicating God's word. And what you have in those verses of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, communication of God's word. You have tongues at that time. And remember what Paul says, if you want to speak in a tongue, there needs to be someone who will interpret so that everybody can be benefited, edified. Uh, you have the idea of for, uh, prophetic utterances, not forth-telling, but foretelling. So you do have that in Scripture. Now, the question is, does that still happen today? Well, I'm under the opinion, I'm a secessionist, I'll, I'll admit that. I'm under the, uh, the belief that the Word of God is what was being communicated then, and we have the Word of God communicated now. I don't believe that there's anything that God left out. I don't think there's a volume B coming. I think this is it. I don't believe that there's still new revelation coming from God. I believe, and I think there's good testimony in Scripture, that this is, this is what you get. This is what you get. Now, there's a difference between new revelation and new inspiration. What do I mean by that? I do believe it's possible by the Holy Spirit's work in us to better understand text that we didn't have as great an understanding of before. I do believe that. But there's nothing new. Jesus told his apostles, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to bring to your remembrance everything I told you he said on another occasion to them, man, I got a whole lot more to tell you guys, but you're just not ready for this right now. But when he, the Spirit, comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. Well, if they receive no new revelation, who are we to get new revelation? But I do believe we get greater or new inspiration. It's already here. I've been here before. I studied it. I thought I had this thing. I'm running to the end zone. We're going to score. We're going to blow out this team. But then I come back later and, wow, I never saw this part before. And I say that out of experience because I, I come back to this book all the time. I think many of you probably have as well. And you look at the text that you've looked at and you thought you had stacked away, put in a suitcase on the shelf. And you look at it again and it just hits you so differently. Well, the word didn't change. But you got a better, you got a newer inspiration. Nothing miraculous in that sense. The Spirit helped you to see it in a better way. And sometimes God has to have us go through experiences that bring out the message even more than before. All right? So if you've ever sat down um, next to somebody you love who's dying and you think about all these texts where the Lord gives you promise after promise and after promise and having passed through that experience, you come back to those texts that you had put by, you, you put on the shelf, you put in the drawer. But you come back to them and you read them. They hit you so much more effectively than they did the first time. 
So yes, I don't think there's new revelation. I don't think there's the tongues and the prophecy still goes on today because of the purpose in the first place. And I also notice that much of the people who claim that are in the self-glorification, not God glory. Remember, those things were designed to tell us about the message of God, tell us the message of God, not for us to put ourselves on a pedestal and say, well, the Lord spoke to me and told me this, that, and the other. Sometimes I think that those who make such statements uh, and predict such things ought to be held to the same standard as the Old Testament false prophets. And if you read that, you'll, you'll get it. You'll get it. Uh, and then last but not least, I guess, uh, the question is, when Jesus returns in his second coming, we see him face to face, then the spiritual gifts of this present age will no longer be. Okay, I know what that is. So there are some people who take 1 Corinthians 13, that, when that which is perfect has come, and they, they take that uh, to talk about Jesus coming again, right? Uh, that doesn't fit the tenor of what Paul is talking about. That's why I don't accept that interpretation that uh, we still have the miraculous gifts until we see Jesus again. Uh, we have to go back to the question, why were they given in the first place? You get Mark, Mark 16 and 15, 16, and go a little further than that down to uh, the end of the chapter. God did a lot of things to the apostles to confirm the word, uh, not the idea of we still need new ways to confirm the word that we have the word. And I believe that the word is sufficient. I think it's full. I think all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable for everything we need. So I don't need any new revelation. Okay. Those are the questions that I received. Are there any other questions? Well, I'm going to get off easy here. I was expecting more. Okay. Anybody got any old by the ways? Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, let me thank you again for using the material. Um, I'm so glad it was used. I'm so glad it's been, I've been told it has been very helpful. And don't let that be the end of your study about the Holy Spirit. Uh, check out more. Don't live beneath your privilege. God has given himself in you allow himself in you to take you where you need to go and where we all need to go. That's to be more and more like Christ. I thank you for the invitation to come. I've had myself in a wonderful time. I've enjoyed it immensely. I want to thank uh, Brother Chris Cox, who's been in contact with me and letting me know the lay of the land and uh, giving me the, the various options and dates and all that in conjunction with the eldership. Uh, for all of that work, I, I'm just grateful to be here. I want to thank you, distinguished minister, for allowing me to stand in his place today. Uh, all of your elders, for all of the hospitality, and all of you for uh, putting up with it from this, uh, the worst from this, this Jersey guy <laughs> uh, throughout the day. May the Lord continue to bless your work and bless your efforts. Uh, if I don't see you again in this life, I'll see you later on in heaven. Thank you. Closing song will be number 234, 234. If you would please stand. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for Brother Brown coming here today and uh, sharing his knowledge of your word. And as we deal with potentially complex issues like the Holy Spirit, let us always look to your word as the final authority so that we can gain a greater understanding of what you are and what the Bible is and what we need to be as Christians in order to accomplish your will. And as we go throughout this week, let us focus on how we can be Christ-like and how we can bring others to Christ so that next Sunday we have an even better and, and bigger service in terms of number and spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.